It's impossible. Another board meeting. He will be in a little bit later. I just heard the door, so that might be him. Kelsey and Cecily are both out of town. Yeah. Um, that's what we'll be. Do we know if Shirley's coming? Shirley Schumacher? Okay. There's Michael. And Michael Banks. You get up here, Mike. Right up here. Up here. Yes, yeah, sir. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Very happy to see you. Yeah, it's just take a small <laughs> bite. <laughs> I'm just no. It on already, and I turned it off. It's okay. All right, you turned it on already. Yeah, thanks, Adam. You got it. Okay, so it's four o'clock. I think we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Adam, are you doing roll call? I will. Thank you. Sure, Lee Schumacher. Michael Grenz here. Larry Horton here. Nick Tyler. Dick Knowles here. Bob Dalton here, Kelsey Ian Ray here. Briefly going to go back in time because we have lots of minutes to approve. We're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did you have to sing? Now we're. The minutes that we're looking to approve are from the January 24th meeting, and we also need to approve minutes from the February 28th meeting. Um, we didn't have a quorum last time to approve of the minutes. Yeah. I, I, would, I would need to accept both sets of minutes. I'll second. Motion passes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. <laughs> we'll get you through that. All righty, and then we have Western University here to present. We do. And then just make sure that the green light stays on and that you're talking to the microphone so that we can collect it for a minute. Yeah, it's, it's on, on already. You're good in Thank good you. shape. <laughs> Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing us to come and speak today. So I am here and I have my colleague Mark with us. And I do believe Jeannie Davis is attending as well via Zoom. And I believe she was going to speak with us too. So hopefully um, we'll hear from her as well. So I am here just to give an update and let everyone know our Guy, not everybody knows who you are. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so my name is uh, hey, thank you so much. My name is Di Lacey, and I work for Western University of Health Sciences. I am the assistant vice president for Western New Oregon, which is our Oregon campus. 
we have been intricately involved with Sweet Home since 2018. So I'm here today to give kind of an overview and an update, let you know kind of what we're doing, introduce some really cool new people. And then Jeannie Davis is also going to uh, give an update. She hosts our community service learning hours which is a little bit different involvement for our students. So we are well embedded in the community of Sweet Home and could not be more excited. So we started our relationship with Sweet Home in 2018. That was the year, a couple years after I came. And we ended up doing something that was very new and provocative. We did a quantitative and qualitative study that our students did with the community of Sweet Home. They looked at the data from Samaritan Health Center to see what the community needed. And that was based a lot on emergency visits to Lebanon and it was some interviews with the local first responders. Pulled all of that data together to see what the community needed. And at the same time, another group of students simultaneously worked. Thank you, Dr. Larry Horton, for helping to pull together focus groups. So the students were able to work between what the community needed and what the community wanted to put together projects and put a path forward for health and wellness in the community of Lebanon. i was sorry, sweet home. So there is outreach that's being done in other places, such Lebanon, such um, places such like Lebanon, but not to this extent. So just so you guys are aware, the projects that we have currently in sweet home are not replicated any place yet. So you guys are actually the shining star of outreach and involvement deep into community. Thank you so much. You have invited us into your city council. You've invited us into your committees, your homes, uh, and your places of business to help our students learn a lot about what being a physician or a physical therapist is going to be like in the future. So that's been very exciting for them. I think one of the coolest things I have ever gotten to do in my career was call one of our students who is now Dr. Brian Green, DO, who is in Michigan, um, and let him know that the one thing he thought he would never be able to accomplish that the focus groups of Sweet Home wanted, which was a clinic here, um, he got. So that was a tearful phone call. He said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no. I said, so it just takes a little longer than you'd like to think it would, Dr. Green. So very cool. He sends his absolute best and is uh, currently trying to figure out a way to get back to Oregon to practice. So well done. Uh, then we accomplished all of the needs that were put on that list by the community of Sweet Home over the last five years. And with the clinic, that was the last request. So last summer, we sent another group of medical students back out for quantitative and qualitative analysis, which by the way, you guys never happens. Longitudinal studies never happen. Um, and it did. So that data was presented back to you uh, a few months back. And we've got another group of medical students because we get a new set every uh, August. So. There's a new group that's going to come out this summer and start to put a plan together around that data. So they will be working closely, hopefully again, pulling together those focus groups and working closely with your community to put that plan together. And then those plans uh, and projects will be what our DOs and PT students are working on through the next five years again, maybe sooner, hopefully we'll get it done sooner. Um, and we'll go from there. At the one of the other requests besides the clinic was a student mentoring program. If you remember, we um, that one caused me a bit of pause. Um, youth mental health is a, a huge issue, and so we wanted to make sure we did that one really well with peer to peer mentoring. So we went to Portland and we had a conversation with the Mike program, M I K E. Uh, that actually was started by two physicians from OHSU. And so it's been in the Portland School Districts for about 10 years. It has got a bulletproof curriculum that had received rave reviews. We were able to bring that here. Typically, most school districts in Portland do pay for that. There is a cost. Uh, we were able to negotiate with the MIC program, and they are using your community as best practice for taking an urban program to see if it would apply to rural 
sites and uh, you have hit the ball out of the park, pass with flying colors, and there's no cost to your community whatsoever for that. Um, we'll keep that going into the per perpetuity, looking at long-term, how does this really affect your youth? Are we really creating that pipeline of healthcare professionals we're hoping for? Uh, and starting to hopefully publish papers and get some information out about what works and what doesn't work. So that's been ran by the last three or four years. We started, if you remember right, we started and then the pandemic hit. And so one of our medical students actually won a national award from the Public Health Service. She won the Excellence in Service Award for the United States. And that was Madeline Duncan. She started the Mike program. The section in the application that we put forward that really won her the award from the public health service folks in their letter was the story of four of your high school students who took their mom's car during the pandemic and would sit behind the bank because they could get really good internet to stay connected with their medical students. So great stories to tell. We've done that over the past three or four years with medical students alone. Now I am so thrilled to say We've waited so long for our PT school, and we now have our PT school up and running. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to Mark, who I will let him tell you his background, introduce himself fully, uh, but he is the liaison for the PT school, and we will be working to embed PT students into all of our projects. Mark? Thank you. Um, and I'm honored to be up here for a couple of reasons. First off, I learned about all of this this morning. I am just kidding. <laughs> I am. I'm learning about it. I'm learning about it. Um, I'm a physical therapist over in Lebanon. Um, and and in the last year, I've gotten started with some part time work at the the physical therapy program there. And just recently was able to um, take a position to to oversee the community service program there. So that's where I fit in this and that's where I'm trying to learn how we can fit into the mic program and different different things like that. Um, another reason why I'm honored to be here, I, I did grow up here in Sweet Home. Um, I'm the, the youngest son of Jim and Gerald Lewis. Um, my parents, my grandparents ran Centium Supply on Main Street for decades and decades. And um, so anyways, I'm I'm grateful for, I know nice many of home. you, many of you that that had a big part in the, the my upbringing and all. So, so thank you for all your work in the town over the, the decades. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a full-time therapist at Sendium Physical Therapy over in Lebanon, um, down by Gills Landing over there. And, and anyways, my, my wife and our three kids and us, we, we live there in Lebanon. And I think that's about all there, there is to that. But again, I'm, I'm just getting started and hoping to, to understand how the physical therapy pro service program can, can join in with what the medical school already has going. So. Nice to have you on board. Thank you. So is Jeannie Davis on the Zoom? No. Okay. <laughs> so she must have got stuck somewhere. She was so excited to speak. So she may come back and, and do hurts. And the, the difference, uh, all of our projects, just so you guys know, all of our projects actually count toward community service learning. We're, we're a little unique as a university in that we require every specialty to provide so many hours of community service or they do not get to walk across the stage and commence. And so um, we ask for more hours than most health science universities I've ever seen, uh, which is incredible because I think it really does round out the education of our students. I think you can educate students okay online and Google and textbooks and that's great. You can do better in classroom and hands-on and simulation, there is no way you can replicate a live human patient. And so before they're really allowed to take care of patients, they need to really understand where do patients live? What do they want? Uh, not just what do they need, but what do they want? And how do we create those relationships? Most all of the programs that we run, at least between Mark and I, um, those are student-led. So the Mike students are nice enough to tell me from time to time, hey, Di, we're bringing the entire Mike program from Sweet Home on a bus tomorrow. 
if you're around, it would be great if you could come by. I'm like, great. I will rearrange my schedule for that. Um, so the education that you're providing for this next generation of healthcare professionals and leaders is absolutely incredible. It is incredible. So we are forever grateful and thankful. Any questions you guys might, guys might have for us? I think, Di, they could probably all come here and work on us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get started on that. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, um, I'm not sure that we ever let you guys know, but I want to make sure that the city of Sweet Home knows we have at the PT school a PALS clinic, P A L S. Now you're going to ask me what that stands for. Uh -huh. <laughs> what I can tell you what it is, is it is a basically a pro bono clinic. So, and we're trying to get it started for the DOs as well. That's a little bit different. So medical regulations for physicians are very different than PT regulations. But um, the PT students are all very much permissible. We have an entire part. You'll notice if you ever come to our PT school, it says patient services on one side of the building. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you can call and make an appointment and come on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's pro bono. The physical therapy students will treat you mm. under the guidance of the faculty. So you don't need an appointment. You don't need a doctor's order. You don't need any of that. You can just come and teach medical students how, or I'm sorry, teach PT students, soon medical students, um, how to take care of patients. So that's really cool. So you'd have to call to make an appointment. Yeah. And they, they, they will take you. The students love to work on community members, so they'll take you. Going back to the mic program, mm -hmm. just real quick. When we first started, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. we had uh, Michelle Snyder, I believe is her name. Yes. Health teacher at the high school. Yes. The Mike students worked with with that teacher and her students. Well, that program has now doubled in size in the five years. Yes. Doubled. Which to me that, you know, it, it says so much about what something like this can do for a community like Sweet Home. I mean, a lot of our students in the past have have thought, you know, I, I'm coming from a low income or I'm coming from, I'm coming from, and all of a sudden now they have an opportunity to grow, big time growth, mm -hmm. and actually get into the medical field. And, and so many options are available thanks to Western and thanks to Michelle Snyder for the work that she has done with the kids and the students. The high, the uh, student doctors are amazing. You know, if you ever get a chance to go watch them working with the kids, they're just they're they're super. I mean, they're closer to their age than yeah. the instructors, so that says a lot right there. The kids listen to them far more than they listen to us older folks, and uh, it's a very impressive program. And I'm just so thankful that it's that it's in our community. And we're very, very fortunate to have it. We're we're fortunate to have Western. I don't think we'd have the clinic that we just got if it wasn't for those surveys and those focus groups and the work that the Western University students did. I don't think we'd have it here. I really don't. Yeah, I think even some of the younger outreach, I know Bob and I before have helped with um, like the kindergarten doctor where the students yep. would come out and yeah. And it's the best thing ever seeing the little kindergartners get so excited and put on all this stuff and dress in the gowns. And the students were so good with them too, because it's very chaotic in a kindergarten yeah. class. <laughs> I came home from that last Friday. <laughs> no, it's a great time. So yeah. yeah, I think the, your guys' students are wonderful and it's wonderful seeing them out in the community wanting to help students of all ages. Yeah. Thanks for the vision of the university oh, and, and your vision, because truly a major part of that die. This is just a labor of love. I'm truly. Um, there's two other little pieces of that as well. Um, one, I, I'm not sure that you guys know, but the Mike students, both medical students, DPT now too, and the high school students have to work together on a project, which is really cool. And, um, so this is all because Michelle and I had coffee again. I, you guys, 
Michelle Snyder is just one of the most incredible educators I have ever met. And her class is not easy. When Dr. Horton says that that class is doubled, uh, her class is not easy at all. So you you really have to raise your chin up to stay in that, that um, course. But we put together a poster contest. And the poster contest, yes, it's a fun project, but what we were trying to get the students to do especially at a time when even vaccinations was so it started right after COVID. And here's this, this magical thing that can really help you stay healthy and well from measles to HPV vaccines to all of this um, things that, that didn't exist before and there's more coming. Uh, how do you educate people? H- how do you tell the story? How do you motivate people? And so we had them do posters on the topic of their their choice. And Michelle has them do that poster. She works with them with the medical students and the high school students. Uh, and then we grade. What I what was shocking to me was the incredible talent of the youth in your community. Not only we created a whole new category just for the beauty of the art work that is so the yes message. Yes, research that you actually research, you know what you're talking about, but also the art. These are just works of art. So we actually framed last year's and those are on the hallways in Samaritan. They were put up in Samaritan Hospital. They were put up with us. We made copies of those just because our work was so beautiful. So um, and yes, they all have great messages and the four winners were were fabulous. Uh, The second piece of this is last summer. I don't know if you're aware, but we started a summer program back up a little. Part of the problem with pipeline of getting into Michelle Snyder's class and getting into healthcare is that you have to be really, really baked in your biosciences to get into healthcare. So in ninth grade, typically in the state of Oregon, you get to make a decision about whether you're going physics or you're going biology. If a youth goes physics, that's okay, but it takes a lot longer to get them back over into the biosciences. And you have to have all those as prerequisites. So you have to make that decision about which science you're taking January or March of your eighth grade year. So if you don't hit those eighth graders and get them really set on which way they want to go, they could go the wrong way and then find out later, right? So we want to get them in the right path. So the Mike students and uh, high school and Western U came together with Dr. Juliet Ascension, who is working on your clinic, right? So she's one of our alumni. Mm-hmm. So she has a very deep vested interest with um, Western U and with the students in general. So she put together with the students and Michelle Snyder, I had nothing to do with this. I just help, help them get started and then they do magic. They did a summer immersion program for eighth graders here at the clinic part clinic and part high school. And these eighth graders did everything from, you know, learn how to work certain pieces of equipment to stethoscopes to they they had a whole immersion camp for four days that was completely put on, no cost. Everybody figured out how to make it go. Michelle even figured out how to provide lunches on a after school day. So um, you've got some tremendous programs going. Hopefully we'll do it again this year and keep that going. So um, well done as a community. Well done. At some point, guys, we're going to need to tout our Tudor horn and, and fly our flag. And I was just brainstorming with Mark how we will do that next year. Let's get the PT students in. And then I think we've got a really good story to tell across the state of Oregon. So um, we'll work with you to be very thoughtful about how we do that. But I think this is a big deal. Great. If if I might, uh, for Dr. Lewis, um, Shirley Schumacher, who's usually here, uh, works out of the uh, senior center. And one of the things that was driving her was they have a a group that does exercises, et cetera. And one of the suggestions I made was maybe develop some contact with you um, to see if you could help polish that, (laughs) Uh, make it a little more formal 
uh, whatever, uh, you know, I, I can put you in touch with her or vice versa. But, yeah, that would that would be great. Mrs. Yeah. Schumacher, you said. Yeah. And, and, and they, it was the senior center they, here in town. I think they do once, I think it's once a week. They have a small group that meets, but obviously if there's somebody driving them a little harder <laughs> uh, and putting a little more professional charm to it, I think they can build that up. But, okay. We can get that contact information. Okay, for sure. Great. To Thank you. you. Yeah. Adam can. She's she's actually been chomping at the bit because I brought it up about two months ago, long before your name came up. Oh. And she keeps wanting to know when is this going to happen? When is this going? <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll do something about that. And we had also discussed um, we have an upcoming health fair we do annually the third week in August. Uh, and one of the things we had tried was a uh, kind of a mild jaunt or more uh, before the health fair. Uh, and it might be kind of fun to get together with the students and have them take part in some kind of... Get them back. Yeah. Uh, the person who had been doing it was... Vendor flyer. Yeah, the person who had been doing it was out of the steelhead uh, you know, uh, group. And it's just, it's hard to do. Not to mention that sometimes it rains and sometimes it's, <laughs> you know. Um, but again, I think if, if we can put the students at least in the middle of it or one or two of them, I guess again would drive it and tie it back to the high school and uh, Boys and Girls Club, et cetera. So I'll, I'll put you in touch with Shirley. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So we've taken a, a pretty good run at some low-hanging fruit that was all derived from some data, right? So that's where we started. That's how we got Mike. It's how we got the clinic. It's how we got um, the resource um, guide that we put together. And we, we do have a new set of data that come out and that was presented. Um, but we would really look to this committee to help inform and help us with what you see some of those issues are. Where we started in 2018 is a very different place from where we are now post COVID uh, and a couple economic recessions and some other um, socio economic impacts on our community. Um, what can we do or what should we be doing? And may not have an answer now, but please feel free to reach out and contact when you see those things. Mark and I will both be looking at projects, um, some maybe that are just really short term and easy, easy spins. But if there's a longer, more longitudinal, which is kind of what we're working with with the data, uh, if there are places that you know as community members that we seriously need to be looking at, uh, that you feel we could make an impact. We'd be very open to that for sure. It's very fulfilling for the students. And, and I think these projects, different than just community service learning where they go, you know, volunteer at the soup kitchen for the day. And that's great. Um, but you don't always see those people get better. You don't feel sometimes that you've really made that impact. Uh, these guys need that education to figure out how do I really make an impact? How do I fix this? Healthcare is, you know, I, I'm... I'm an old healthcare executive for 38 years. Um, I have too many patients. I don't have enough healthcare providers and I'm out of money. So the math is really easy. We're going to need to keep people healthy and well. So how do we do that in a community where um, you guys are just this perfect place to, to make this magic happen? This committee, I don't think it sits in every community. I don't think there is one. So um, what are those other things we can do? Very open to it. If, if I might, again, it just that just reminded me, uh, uh, Bob and I actually worked with a couple of students and developed a resource list um, back when we were trying to figure out uh, what was going on with the police department and how they could handle particularly difficult folks. Uh, you get stuck with somebody who's babbling at the moon at two in the morning on Friday. Uh, who do you call? What do you, you know, what are the resources available and uh, we we had quite a lengthy set of visits um, over time and it occurred to me those folks may not know the impact <laughs> that they had they put a lot of work into this 
And we, Bob and I were just talking. I don't know if that's still going on, but the police department carried around a, a small flyer in, in their cars and something came up, they'd grab it and, uh, you know, call a church. They would call chance was involved at the, at the time. Um, all that stuff was very helpful. So that was the third, right, of the three from the community. So it was, that's great to know that that was an impact. So I will be talking to Dr. Brian Green again. I will let him know that he's he's very excited. Um, uh, that remember, I'm excited to hear his name. That's yeah. Him. And if you bring him back, if you remember, I was just telling Mark when Brian went up to present right as a young medical student, and he was just presenting to the focus groups and in walked Samaritan health folks and the media and. This poor individual looked at me and he goes, now what? I said, oh, you got this. This is your home. You're good. Um, one of the places students have asked, um, uh, our students are very motivated to become um, kind of a solution or a thought partner or help in any way with the unhoused. So if that's something, I, I know that uh, Dr. Jeannie Davis has uh, some community service learning our projects. I don't know if they have to do with the unhoused at this time, but I know that you guys were really put a stake in the ground for at the time your proposal, I thought was best practice. Um, it was it was exceptional. So um, there may be some intersections for there as well. All that back on to what uh, Dick was talking about that resource list that that has been one of the cha most challenges we've ever had is where are the resources? And I don't know how many of those resource lists we've put out there. It's where do you put them? And it seems like we can put those things on multiple places and we still get asked, where's the resource list? So I don't know if you put it on a banner and, and flag it in town <laughs> where people see it. It's a tough one. I don't know if it's cell phone access or what it is, but that's a challenge. Sorry, I'm your old healthcare exec. One, um, a project that students could easily do if you're interested is to do a survey to find out where is the best place and identify your top three locations of where to put um, your resource list. Things like that are easy projects for students, um, but they learn a lot in the process. So please remember you are educating this next generation as much as I am. Um, and for them just to get that information of, oh, not everybody has a cell phone that is right, you know, all that stuff is really important. It, the audience was just saying 211 is another yeah. really good place to access information. But you know, but if you ask the majority of the people out they there, don't know what that they is. They don't know what 211 is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you publicize it more, put it on the city's website. I don't know. You know, flashing sign. Okay, it's not just me because it's I, I use it for my patients and it's not reliable. I'm, str yeah. I'm struggling too. I don't tell anyone. So. Yeah, because I there <laughs> there's times where it's really great for some of the folks that I've assisted that are living in the Salem area or visiting family in the yeah. Portland area and everything's up to date. Um, but I mean, it we kind of run into the same problems we were seeing with some previous resource lists that are put out. It is not up to date contact information isn't accurate, services provided aren't accurate. Um, so I think it works great for some places, but not, But yeah. But as a group, they, they, uh, well, there's a particular woman who's kind of the voice of it, and they are active all the time. So it isn't that they aren't try, trying. You'll hear, she'll be the first to tell you, you know, as soon as I walk out of the room, the numbers change. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's a difficult situation, but it was very it, it, and remains helpful with the uh, police department locally. And I mean, there are uses. And, and you do have some resources. So I, I would even on that, you might talk to um, Michelle Snyder and see if that is a good for a subset committee of the Mike program that once a month they can go and validate Check and make the phone calls. Right. So this this generation does know how to use a website and a phone pretty good. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. I also have to say that um, one of the other pieces was Dr. Juliet Ascension had called us during the pandemic and she had said, hey, Di, 
you and I, we need to go to the CDC and scream because they made these grotesque assumptions about urban living and applied it to rural in that the only way you could sign up for your vaccination for COVID was via internet. Well, that's great, but my rural communities don't always have internet, electricity, or the know how to do that. So we had medical students that were actually calling Dr. Ascension's patients, staying on the phone with them and signing them up for vaccines. So um, students come in pretty handy for that. And if it's information, um, that would be a great project for them. So. Very good. One, one other, uh, and I've come across it in the last few months. I've got a, quite a few friends that are in-home caretakers. And uh, in fact, I talked to one today and she was just literally in tears with me. She was kind of like at her wits end, you know, I mean, she's working so hard to do this for her husband and it's kind of like that borderline decision. But what I find with the ones that I have associated with, they don't know what the resources are for them, you know, and I, so I was online today looking, I said, well, there are resources out there. Some of the creation it's based on income, whether you get those in home resources. But I thought, you know, there's an area us baby boomers, we're getting older and a lot more people are taking care of a spouse or a family member. And what do they do? You know, they're, they're frustrated. In fact, I found a, a good resource guide today it was about 60 some pages of information. I just sent it to her. I said, I know you're already doing a lot of this, but here it is, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of people out there probably in our community, because we do have an older community that they're up against that, you know, and they don't know what's available to them. How can I get that help? Who do I talk to type stuff? So, I mean, I, you look at the Department of Human Services, of course, you can go right there, but you, you hit a wall at some point, you know. You know, it's interesting. And so I've been in healthcare probably, oh, I'm old, 43 years. Um, we used to have su this, this community level and we had parish nursing. We had these great service clubs that that really did focus on health and wellness a lot of times. So, and you knew who your neighbors were. You did weekend barbecues all the time out in the streets. I remember as a kid, we did. Um, as we've lost a lot of that. Many times we don't even know sometimes who our neighbors are. Or we haven't spoken to them in a long time. We definitely haven't knocked on their door and said, how's it going or brought them hot cookies in a while. And we used to do that all the time. So we are working hard across healthcare in general health and wellness to try to figure out how can we plug those holes? My parish nurses in any small community, they they were just embedded in faith-based organizations. They knew that congregation. And if you got the sniffles, someone was assigned to your door with a casserole. Um, we have, we've lost a little bit of that. And for our in-home caregivers, when do they get respite? When do they get a day off to go to an exercise class or an out to lunch? And who can sit with John or Harold just for a little while and just make sure they're okay? Um, I don't know that medical school students and PT students can do that. We will have to do some checking, but could that be something they could go in pairs and do together? All of those things, we've got to find a way to fill in the gaps that we used to cover. Yeah. Um, and by the way, back then when we had all of those community resources, medicine could cure far less than we can cure today. Um, there were just people and you just got sick and someone just made sure you were comfortable. And we, we really have to switch, I, I think, our mindset. Urban, I don't think this works. Sweet home, I you guys have the opportunity really to look at health and wellness in a very different way. You're well down that path. And I just believe with all my heart that you are going to end up to be best practice for how communities take care of their own. And, um, and that's her biggest challenge is getting that one day off for herself. You and I told her, I said, you got to take care of yourself because if you don't recharge that battery, you're not helping that person. So. people don't know their neighbors that they need to start especially during emergency mm -hmm. when you don't know whether somebody's coming in and out from their home whether they're able to get in and out but what you were talking about and i see is a lot of the 
healthcare services, COG takes care of some of them, county takes care of some of them, uh, this group takes care of some of them, but nobody really oversees who takes care of what. So in small communities, some of those things get lost. Is there a way that maybe some of that stuff could be uh, under one roof? Oh, well, you've got a couple best practices out there. Um, so I know that Dick sits on CHIP. Um, are you still part of CHIP? Yeah. Um, and so um, th there are organizations that have tried to be a little bit comprehensive, but I'm going to be honest. I've been doing this a really long time. I think I've worked in ev almost all communities in Oregon from time to time. And part of Washington, I had Washington for a while, and I had Alaska. So um there was a model out there, and you're not going to believe it, but I, Florence, Oregon, through this party, and we did it years ago, and it worked. And they, it really was the committee, it was this committee, you know, just it was the Florence Area Coordinating Council. It's still going. And what they did is they found a bucket of money to have every buddy on that resource guide just have lunch once a month or once a quarter. And everybody just started to talk about what everybody else was doing. At first, it started out with just what do you do and where do you get your money? And then pretty soon it turned out to, to be, oh, we're working on the same thing. Well, why are we doing that with this bucket of money and you're doing that with that bucket of money? Um, but it was it was community specific, not county, not region, because that that gets complex. Sweet Home is not Lebanon. It's just you got to go by zip code, sometimes neighborhood in a larger place. Um, that Florence Area Coordinating Council is still going on, and they have probably I've seen the best outcomes in that community of you just know who to call, right? To your point on that resource guide, and that's you could actually update your resource guide every month. But it you've already got the committee. They had a hard time getting committee members. You know the agencies would come for food. That was no problem. But uh, it was actually getting the committee together. And you already have that. So I, I think you guys are probably further down the road than you think you are. And um, trying to figure out who's doing 211. And she's she's probably going to tell you, well, I, I try to call and get the number, but nobody calls me back. And there's all of that mm -hmm. disconnect. And in federal, state, county, and city, the funding buckets for all of these and how they get paid, it's its really complex. So getting everybody in the room, um, you know, you got to throw that barbecue. That's what you got to do and bring all those agencies together, just like we did of residences on the street. So Jim, one idea. Jim, if I might um, just kind of broach the issue. One of the, one of the issues is there's what, four, six, eight, 12 different funding buckets and each one of those funding buckets wants you to do a different thing and uh, expecting a single entity to be the boss of it is assuming they're all getting the same funding and it's just not happening. But to the point, uh, Di and I were kind of involved in the original part of the CHIP process that now expanded it considerably. Mm -hmm. And now that we have the coordinated care organizations, the CCOs, which in this area is three counties under uh, under basically Samaritan, um, that ship has now become regional. And part of that discussion is exactly around, maybe we'll have the CCO model, which is that whole medical model. And within that, CSC is part of it, 211, 211 people are part of it. Everybody's under the same umbrella. They just had, this is the first year that we're trying to actually gather all the information. The, the counties are required to go out and do a health assessment. Each of the individual hospitals are required to develop their own health assessment. This CCO, IHN, health everybody's got this health assessment and then finally someone said why are we doing five different health assessments you're, you're not five different hands are knocking on one person's door asking them to do an assessment do one assessment oh duh right 
So this year they tried, we're struggling, um, but it does take time. I mean, actually you almost have to do the first one to realize what's wrong, do the second one to try to polish it. Mm-hmm. And it's that third or fourth year and it, oh, yeah, this is gonna work. So I, I think we're I think we're getting there, and I I think it's going in that direction. There may not be a single source, but it it it's gonna if we can get it down to two or three, we'll be better than the five. You know, I just see many groups all right. doing the same thing. Yeah. Right. And yep. nobody really is responsible to come in and do sweep home. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, if you call them, they'll help. Right. Yep. So if I may be so bold, um, so um, that model that Dick's talking about, those community health needs assessments were started in 2012. I actually was in charge of a mall for Peace Health for all hospitals in all states. Um, when that came down from the IRS and you had to do those to keep your not-for-profit standing. And then you have to do a chip to, you know, this is you have to identify what's wrong and then you have to tell them what you're going to do to fix it. Um, we actually came together at the time, so it was uh, all of Vancouver and all of Portland. So that we came together it was city at the table. There were nine hospitals, six health departments, and three CCOs. And um, we came together to do one CHNA because all the patients were about the same. They just if they didn't get what they wanted at my hospital, they went to the other hospital. So. Um, what we found in that was that it was really hard to get. We we thought, okay, so we got this CHNA done. Here we go. Let's pick one thing and work together. It never worked. It never worked. The funding sources were so fragmented. We couldn't, so it was a big thing. You guys have, and again, to my point, you have this council to pull in what resources you have here um, to actually work on sweet home so you're so far ahead of everybody else there's lots of people doing it at a at a big level that that neighborhood barbecue i have seen that work i'm not sure about the rest yet that's all out but yeah i have seen the neighborhood barbecue work and students can help you with that as well so yeah thank you guys so much anything that we can do to help please let us know this has just been such an honor to work with your organization and i'm so excited that mark is here oh my goodness so we jumped on the call today and uh, they let me know that okay we've got we've got mark and uh, dr lewis and he's dedicated to and i said great I'm gonna call danny goes well you know i am from sweet home that was just like oh does this get any better today i don't <laughs> think so so we're excited Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both for being here. Thank you, Doug. Mark will be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Di. I always hate I always hate to bad mouth two on one in the public because they 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 do a lot of work. But I just noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's basically just one lady, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she came and spoke to our Rotary Club, and that was what I heard her saying: "Is it's just me? That's it." Well, and it's hard because the um, I don't necessarily always call two in one. Sometimes I've used like their site, or I've sat with patients to use the site, and there's yeah, I don't know. It's also been years, but there was a lot of struggles with things on the site. Like we couldn't get it to load or it would put things in different places. And so we're just like, well, we would just jot down all the resources listed and then just call them or Google them individually off of this site and then try and find it. Maybe it would be a good idea to have, what, what is her name? Shannon. Shannon to come and talk to us. Let us know what her needs are. And, you know, everybody's asking her, maybe we should have. What do you think? Good idea. Do Hopefully you know probably. Shannon? Could you talk to her and see if she'd be open to something like that I, down the road? I can do that. Does Good. anyone use the Community Services Consortium um, resource? Yes. Every day. <laughs> yeah. 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 What I, question? You know, I, I got that bookmarked. Okay. <laughs> used to used to pick up. Uh, Used to work over and two rivers and, and they used to have the, the book. Yep. You can yep. look at it online now. Yeah. <laughs>
and they have the same difficulty. They're, yeah. they're actually the ones that were. Yeah, I have the same. I have the pamphlet too. And they, they just. Huge spreadsheet that we all, a bunch of us, all work on. We know who she is. So, but it was hard to keep it up to date too. But we had for all the communities right. in Benton, the county, and uh, you know, all the shelters, all the you know, addiction centers. But it's hard to stay up to date. I get that. It really is. With all the technology we have, it's just a technical person. I'm not a technical person. Is there anything from anyone in the audience? Any needs, questions, concerns, comments? We're looking right at you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, audience. <laughs> we don't give out loans, though. <laughs> yeah, no loans. Well, you said you were busy, so I guess my question for you would be from your position, uh, what are you seeing as needs? Before you answer that, can you please step up to the microphone for the minutes? That's true. Why do I have to ask a question, right? <laughs> Thanks, Adam. And for the minutes, can you say your name and where you live? Christy Walker, Sweet Home School District. Um. There's a lot of poverty. There always has been in our community, but I'm really noticing it even more so this school year than the last two years. So, um, you know, people got a lot of COVID money and they didn't seem to be as needy. We thought we were jumping in ready to help and ready to roll and they're just, the needs weren't as big. Now people are hurting for money. For groceries groceries have gotten so expensive a lot of people can't afford to make it through the month without getting supplemental food um a lot of people looking for a place to live rents are ridiculous um yeah so that's been a lot of our needs a lot of financial needs i know i came across an individual what was it Bymart the other day and I, I picked up on her conversation I she looked at me and what it was she had lost her husband a year ago she said I can't even pay my electric bill this month mm -hmm. and she says I, I said well she had spent a lot of her own personal income to try to get through the money was depleted but I said well aren't you getting any sort of your husband's benefits or issues they told me i couldn't get them and i and it just kind of amazed me that she was up against that because they'd been married a while but i said social security is turning you away and she said they were and i and i just said you know go back and pound on the door but it just shocked me that she was in that position after all this time that she right. didn't have the resources she needed just to have a and daily she didn't have somebody to help advocate for her well, i think that was part of it too she just didn't know where to go yeah. Yeah. you know she, she didn't know lost. what questions to ask how where is she supposed to push and yeah and, and i we find that a lot even with our families in the school district i mean they don't know how to advocate for themselves or don't know where to go to do this or that and we've got family service liaisons that end myself and we we really work hard at advocating so from the student standpoint, what are you seeing there for, you know, that, I mean, you talk about housing and food and that, which impacts obviously uh, students' uh, behavior you, and well-being. Like we were just talking about one today. We have a little guy, he's in second grade, and he isn't getting his basic needs met at home. And so he comes to school, they make sure he has breakfast, and then he takes a nap for a while because he's exhausted because he just is not getting enough sleep at night. And yeah. um, and then he wakes up and he's ready to learn, but you know, just the basic needs. He really is coming to school just for his basic needs versus mm -hmm. learning. And so we're providing that a lot. We have a lot of behavioral issues as well, students I, and behavior. I know after we met with you last year, I guess it was Dick and I with the, the administrator and that, I was shocked to hear some of the numbers that was coming out of the school district. And I yeah, go- our special ed. Numbers are crazy. Mm -hmm. 
they are crazy. Mental health, um, you know, we've been pleading for that. And it's actually, I'm not going to say the students' mental health has gotten better. I think somewhat. We've got more providers, though. We do have a mental health provider in at the high school. We have one at the junior high that is hired by the district. Um, Lynn County is keep saying they're going to bring in some more providers for us, that they've got more providers, that they're looking to hire more. Yeah, they can't find them. I know. <laughs> That's the problem. It they're, is. There's a shortage. They're, they're creeping up. Yeah. They just... Well, I see more. They're kind of leaning towards the telemed for mental right. health. And we have, there's a, there's a, um, Charlie Health is a telemed for mental health for kids. And it's been pretty good. We have quite a few students that are utilizing that. Good. It's been a good program. Charlie uh, Health. Charlie yeah. Health. Charlie. That's the first I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a great program. We're, we're expecting County Mental Health next month. So stay tuned. Let's hope so. <laughs> well, we hear that mental health constant. Oh, it's a such a need in our community. Every day on the news. Every, every, oh, everywhere. Every day on the news. Every, yep. You know, and and I think, you know, and then define mental health because mental health just isn't somebody that's well, on it's meds. All I mean, you've got substance I mean, abuse from anxiety to PTSD. You've got all this stuff. And I then, mean, all of us, all of us deal with mental health for our right. own personal life. We lose someone in our family. We're dealing with someone that's sick. Someone's had an accident. You know, I mean, it, it all is a piece of it, yep. but uh, yeah. Some more severe than others. Well, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> on the house. <laughs> so you guys going to do a health fair update or not? Yeah. Where's the health fair update? Bob? Uh, it's uh, <laughs> the health <laughs> fair is in I August, in August the 17th. Um, it's on the docket. Um, I've just updated the vendor list and then I my plan is to put it out the middle of next month and get it out the door and get it mailed to everyone so basically for me it's easy to go back and follow up on the people that have already been there and then look for other opportunities I know this year I just went for an eye exam not too long ago and of course it was a young guy in there and I said what are you doing in August you know I just and I said I've always wanted to someone in the eye care piece would you be interested in he said, uh, tell me about it. So I did. And then he went and got one of his associates to come in and said, this, see what Bob's doing. And so they plan on coming this year, which is a first for us to have someone there that can talk about eye care and maybe do the eye exam or something, you know. So they were all excited. But it, it was like getting the youth in there that's <laughs> got some new, fresh ideas because I've been beaten on the doors of the older generation I care and it's like, yeah, we've got our clients. I don't need to go do that. So it was kind of nice. So, but look to see that come out. So, uh, the time frame we usually start at nine and get it done at two is the plan. And last year it's been outdoors and we've been pretty successful that I know Dick was probably, <laughs> we were both kind of reluctant in the beginning because Oregon weather, you never know what happens, but. We've been blessed uh, the last couple of years to have decent weather to have it out front. So, covered hallway. <laughs> That's always the plan. We'll so, help set up. Have the yeah. We'll do the normal setup. I'll I'll get the permit and uh, those that come and help flip tables and chairs, which is this group right here <laughs> normally. So, if we get more volunteers. That's awesome. But and then you know I'd ask for. And I'd ask for our committee, if you have other resources out there that we haven't had to that health fair, you know, let me know what they are so I can reach out to them or any of you out there that you think, what are we missing that we can, you know, add to the event? Uh, definitely, if the medical students would come, that'd be a plus to get them back. They're doing some sort of a kid activity or something like that to get the little ones involved. I'll but, make sure that I re- They've done that before. Amy Davis has yeah. done every yeah. year. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. the face for the little kids because I... I hear parents talking about it. They come into my area and oh, yes, it's fun games and bundles. Yeah. Well, the, the like kindergarten it. group, what, what you did, yeah. something like that for those younger kids, it would be wonderful. Hey, let's dress up like a yeah. doctor. You, yeah. Wow, this is what a stethoscope does. And, yeah. Yeah, and, that'd be a great, great little. And then even yeah. having the, the, the big boost for us too was having the backpack program join. 
Uh, yeah. That brought a lot of people there. And last year, a lot of them stayed. The kids were out amongst us, but a lot of them filtered right over in there. So it worked out pretty well to have that group in there. Yeah, talk with Jeannie about that. Or of course, having right. a few snow cones didn't hurt either. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's a big good. Yeah. Students. Good. That's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Do you know Dude. how many vendors you have on your list of work? We had 40, what, Dick, 48 some last year. So I look to do that, plus a few more if I can. If I see a resource out there, I'll go after it. So um, <laughs> maybe selling cars this year. I don't know. We'll get somebody there. I'll, I'll find some new new blood. Good. But listening to Di and some of the others today around mental health and that, I think, and Dick's been involved in mental health, obviously, but we've got opportunities out there. I think maybe look for some other resources we probably could pull in, like the senior services and some things that people don't know is out there. So, yeah, yeah. Check, <laughs> check that box off, would you? It's done. <laughs> you're doing great just call this meeting done and get get it done now would you <laughs> lisa did you have anything you want to share i mean awful quiet back there we've missed your face i nice having it here was that what, oh i thought you said i'll be back <laughs> and we wrote that down <laughs> I just can't help my mind keeps going back to it that um, because of the history of our community and the makeup and everything, if part of something that we should brainstorm and think about really deeply is education for our youth on social and emotional intelligence, because that's anger management, making goals, all of those things that they're dealing with every day that they aren't getting possibly from their parents. And if they are, maybe another voice added to that. But a lot of them don't get it in their home. And so where are they going to learn it? But that is directly related to their ability to keep a job, their ability to keep a relationship, their ability to make it through high school and set goals to go on, on to further education. And so I don't know that we've put enough emphasis on that. And if there's anything that we could stimulate to make that happen at a greater rate, please make us a Petri dish, dish a test group for some kind of program for K all the way up through 12 that we could help our kids in that area. Because I think that's the root of a lot of our cultural issues and our health issues in our community. And so that's my mind just keeps always going back to that. And I don't have the answers. That's not my field, but um, I really think that maybe if there's some grants or something out there that could help us get there. We have an excellent yeah. opportunity with those students from Di Lacey's program. If that's Why couldn't they run some focus groups and find out what the kids are looking for, do some research and come up with an activity plan mm -hmm. to deal with some of those things? I know that counselors are doing they have different programs, mostly uh, K through six, but uh, the whole orange frog thing going on, I think that tells though, and the counselors go in and teach and trying to deal with anger yeah, and emotional feelings and how do you deal with them. Um, there are programs out there that counselors are utilizing. But I don't know what all they I know there's a boys a girls group, a boys group. It's a specialized program. Um, Jackson Street, I think, is doing it at the junior high. But it's just on a focus view. Yeah. It really needs to be embedded in our curriculum, right. in our community, to where even the parents are being educated yes. so that they know what their kids are learning and they can be part of that. Be stakeholders in this, and so I really think that. Well, 
That's something we need to look at. Well, feed him some pizza or hot dogs, you know, <laughs> and and maybe, I don't know. I, I think that I, I don't want to miss that opportunity if there's resources out there that we could um, do a wider swath because I think that's entrenched in poverty and um, and our homelessness and a lot of the things we're facing. And just real quick to bring notes, I think you just, the last word you said there, the homelessness, and there's a lot of it in their news right now. It's splattered all over the front pages of our newspaper. Sean Morgan was quoted in the, the latest ad. So I think for this committee and for our community and our leadership in Sweet Home, we need to stay on top of and be aware of what's going on with the FAC and funding in that. It's in jeopardy. And I think we need to keep that on our mind because I know Larry and the group worked so hard to get that and Sean and the others to get where we're at today, which kind of has led a lot of other communities to look at us to what we were doing. But <clears throat> if you've seen, there's a lawsuit out there, Grant's Pat. Pa uh, pass pants that's a good one but um i i think we can't lose focus on that as a community or as a committee and we need to keep that we should know within the next few weeks where the fate of the fac is so it's in jeopardy I think she's oh. she, she's gaveled. Thanks, everybody. Was your gavel to adjourn the meeting? Yeah. Oh yes, he told me to just hit it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. She's got it. Let the record show that the meeting was adjourned at five oh five p.m. Gavel. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>